Before I go into the, the, the title of the message, you know, you know, I, I'm originally from Brazil, so I had to learn English. And I must say, I really love the language. English, we have some expressions that are like uh, super funny. Now, I just love it. So, just the other day, I learned a new one. Because I have to. No, it's like, so I well, it's good to see you. I, I was right here. I, I said, I told you that it's good to see you. Are you what he said? It's good to be seen and not viewed. Have you guys heard that before? Well, it's good to be seen but not viewed, right? There's another one that I say a lot. You say, how are you doing? I'm blessed by the best. Right? And there's a lot of expressions. But recently, I learned this new one. You know, have you ever heard this expression, I feel, I feel like a penny waiting for change? I mean, no, nobody ever heard that before? Oh, so I'm happy, so I'm not the only one who ever heard that before, right? Because, but as I heard this expression, I feel like a penny waiting for change. And you know what that means? Just that you, you know a penny, there's no change for a penny, right? So if you feel like a penny waiting for a change, you're hopeless. Right? I mean, you're downtrodden and you're really, really sad. And, and I mean, you're pretty much hopeless. You, you feel like you are worthless. Now, jokes aside, have you felt like a penny waiting for change? Have some of your hands, right? I felt like a penny waiting for change many, many times before. Now you just feel like hopeless. And sometimes you feel worthless and you feel unworthy. So if that's the case, if you have ever felt like a penny waiting for change, if you ever felt hopeless before, or you just thought you could not make it, and you feel it like, like this right now, this message is for you. Because everything God does is amazing. amazing. And He's going to do something amazing today. Let us pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for Veronica and for Rosemary being baptized today. But now we are going to open your word, eternal, unchangeable. Speak to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I, I got to say this, I miss preaching. It's been a few weeks since I was last year uh, uh, preaching. We had Mother's Day, which was a blessing. We had Pathfinders and Adventures in Pathfinders last week, which was a blessing. But it's time now for us to go back and, and refocus on the series we were studying before. The series is called Dynamics. On the first message, we learned that this prophecy is, is based on the prophecy of Acts 1 8. This one, Jesus says, And you will receive power. And we, on the first message, we looked into the, what, what it means to us this, the word dynamis. The southern word dynamis is the same word for power in the New Testament. The word for power in the Greek is dynamis. But also, we learned that in the Greek language, there is another word that derives from dynamis. What word is that? Dynamite. Exactly. So it, what the Holy Spirit is willing to give us is like a dynamite, kind of like a power. It is a power that will give you so much power that you could not accomplish something and now you can accomplish. That's what we saw in the first message. But in the first message we saw also the prophecy that takes place in the book of Acts that says that God said, My Spirit will be poured out upon what? All flesh. Of course, all flesh that is willing, Beverly. Everybody is willing to receive that kind of power. So in the first message we learned, because it's going to be poured out upon all flesh, we learned that God will enable us, and we learned that God, there are no excuses. That means, no matter who you are, where you come from, and how old you are, God will enable you then to accomplish what God has for you. He will do that, Rosemary. He will do that. He will empower you to accomplish what God wants us to do. And it is power. And we ended the first message with the metaphor of the water and the rain. Do you guys remember that? In the Old Testament, in the ancient world, there are two main rains. One happened in the spring, and that was called the early rain. And then what happened in the fall, and that was called the latter rain. The early rain happened in the beginning, so the crops could germinate. So they would grow strong. It was a rain, there was a downpour, so the crops could, be, could, could start and begin strong. 
There were rings in between the two major rings. But then in the last, in the end, during almost at the end of the fall, before the harvest was fully ready, there was another downpour, so they would finish a strong. One you begin strong, and one you finish strong. That was the first passage. And we saw that the, that the Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit poured down upon the apostles, that was the equivalent to the early rain, and it's because the church needed to start strong and in the last day before right before jesus comes there will be another downpour of the holy spirit that would be the latter rain. but in between the early and the latter there's a whole lot of rain as well there is no drought of the spirit in, the, in god's church amen but we have to be willing to get wet now that was the first message then on the second message we learned the other metaphor of the holy spirit we talked about fire. Anybody remembers that the Christian can be on fire, right? You know when you're on fire, you're enthusiastic. You're a bold. You want to preach the gospel. You want to share the word to everybody else, but you're not a fool. You are not, you are tactful. You're not unkind. You care about how people feel. But also we saw that a Christian can also be found. Everybody remembers that? under fire when you are under fire that means that god is working with you now when we are anybody ever been under fire you're going to miss your hands nobody we got some hands right you've been under fire when you are under fire is that your character is being built remember this the, the illustration of the butter and the clay and the sun the same sun that is hitting, uh, sitting on, on, uh, on, the, on the butter and on the, on the clay is the same sun. But what happens to the butter in the sun? It melts. What happens to the clay? It hardens, strengthens. When you are under fire, God is melting away what needs to go in your life and is strengthening what needs to be strengthened and hardened in your life. And the other dynamic that a Christian can also be found out of fire. And that's not what you want to be. You do not want to be found without the Holy Spirit. But today we're looking into, the, into another passage, another, another side of this passage that we have not seen yet. We will really try to understand a little more carefully what does this prophecy mean to us today. You ready for this? I have a few texts on the screen and others will have, I'm not ask you to read. But I'm going to start with again uh, Acts 1, 4, 5 and 8. This is 1, 4 and 5. And it says this. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them. Who commanded them? Jesus. To not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. And then verse 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be everybody witnesses to be where? In Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now this is interesting. Maybe you don't know this, maybe you do. But you know that the book of Acts is divided in a very interesting way? Open your Bibles right now. Open your Bibles. I want you to open your Bibles right now, and I want you to go to the book of Acts. Maybe you want to mark this down. It, 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 it isn't a study guide, this, but I want you to go to the book of Acts. I want you to know this. From chapters 1 to chapter... Just go... Just, just hold the page between chapter 1 and chapter 7. Hold the page. You see that I got what I'm going to read right now. Right? Between chapter 1 and chapter 7, the ministry takes place where? In Jerusalem. That's everything there. So this is a period, Norma, of about three and a half years. Right there. Acts, Acts 1, 1 through 7. Then if you go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and 9, the gospel now goes into another region. What region is this? Samaria. Samaria. There's a persecution in the church. And right there, in Acts 8, you go to verse 4, you see now there are people in Samaria worshiping the living God. Amen? Now, now, if you go to chapter 10, go to chapter 10. Now, they take, now it's chapter 10, verse 1 says that, what does it say there? At? At when? 
Caesarea. You know where Caesarea was? It was kind of the capital of of what? Judea. It's right there. That was the house of the Roman governor. So in chapter 10, the message now goes out of Samaria and goes into Judea and begins going into the Gentile world. What is a Gentile? Well, if you're not, are you a Jew? If you're not a Jew, you are a? See, what's that? So if you don't know what a Gentile means in the Bible, it's not a gentle person, it means that you are not a Jew. That moment, the gospel now leaves the, 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 the realms of the Jews and Samaritans and go into the Gentiles. And then chapter 11 onwards, there is an expansion. If you go, go to chapter 11. Chapter 11. And I want, I want you to go to verse 19. Maybe some of your Bibles have subtitles. Maybe you don't. But right there, in my Bible, the ESV, English is standard version, says it's the church in Antioch. At this time in the book of Acts, the gospel now is no longer in Jerusalem, no longer in Samaria, no longer in where? But now it begins to grow and expand to the whole world. It is amazing, isn't it? The prophecy says they will be by what? My witnesses where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in to the end of so my question to you today, if you're following here, everything I'm saying, were they witnesses in Jerusalem? Yes or no? Yes. Were they witnesses in Samaria? Yes or no? Yes. Were they witnesses in Judea? Yes or no? Yes. Were they witnesses to the ends of the earth? Yes. That's a tricky one, right? <laughs> I'll set you, set you up for this. They, they, they went as far as they could. But they were not able to be witnesses to the end of the earth. So what does this have to do with you and me? That's where you and I come in. They were witnesses to as far as they could, Brother Levi. But it doesn't matter how old you are. God has called you to be a what, everybody? A witness. Now, I want you to understand this here. A witness. Does it say they're lawyer? Does it say lawyer? Does it say jury? Does it say a judge? No, I want, yeah, I bet you guys know what it says. It says witnesses. You guys are not there yet. What is a witness? What is a witness? A witness is someone who has seen and heard something. And they are there now to tell the story of what they have seen and what they have heard. That's what I'm saying, right? God doesn't need an advocate. God does not need a judge. God does not need a lawyer. God needs us to be witnesses what He has done in our lives. Amen? Amen. Oh, Pastor, I can't preach. Tell your story. Pastor, I can't sing like the in His glory. Neither can I. But you know what? You tell your story. Pastor, you know, I can't even teach the Bible. What do you do? You tell the story. And, and, and sometimes we, we miss this idea and we think that only perfect, maybe a pastor who has a, a, a degree in theology or, or a master's or a, maybe the pastor has a doctor, maybe he can preach, he can teach, no, you God is wrong. The disciples could barely read and they changed the world. God has called you where you are right now, Janet, to be an ambassador, to be what? A witness for Jesus Christ. So what do you do? You're going to tell the people. You know those darkest moments of your life when the doctors gave you no hope? You're going to tell the story how God brought you out of this. You're going to tell the, the people how you were raised in this abusive home, that you were beat up and, and abused all the time, and how God walked you through all of that time and where you are today. You're supposed to tell the story when you don't even think you're going to make it. The bills were piling up and you're wondering if you're going to be sleeping in the streets. And you are still here today by the grace of God. You've got to tell the story. We are called to be what, everybody? A witness. Tell the story. The pastor, you don't understand. Pastor, you were an atheist. Now you did a lot of stupid things. You tell a story. You know, the brother there, you know, you know, Calvin and guys in his church, they were out in the world, they were drinking and, and doing foolish things. You guys have a story to tell. I don't. I was raised in church. My life is as boring as it can be. I 
Well, let me tell you this. This is already a story. Because all of us who are out there getting our heads knocked in and, 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 and being killed by this world, that was not fun. We thought it was fun. Your story that God has kept you together all this time, your marriage together, that's a story of itself, amen? amen? Now, and when you think you don't have a story to tell, guess whose story you're going to tell? The Jesus. Tell the story of an amazing God who sent His Son to die so you and I could get to live. Tell the story of the Gospel. It works. It works. It's been working. It is the most powerful story he ever told. How could a loving, how could a mighty powerful God love us so much, Grace, to send His Son to die on the cross for us? Tell the story, now. Tell the story. That's what we ought to do. So our first role, what does this prophecy have to do with us today? We are His. Once again, we are His witnesses. Now we're ready for the second one. Now it's going to get interesting. We are priests. And if you want to call that priestess as well, because we'll see how the Bible really uh, enlarges this here. I want to go to 1 Peter 2.9. This is a powerful verse. Look what Peter is saying here. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, who everybody who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What does it say here? A royal what? Royal? I can't hear you. Royal? royal there you go. Royal priesthood. Now, this text again is very profound. You know why? If you were to tell a Jew in those days that you are a holy nation, you've been chosen, you know what the Jews would do, James? We know that. That's nothing new, right? That's nothing they do. Well, we were chosen, well, we know that. But, 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 but here is, get, gets very, very interesting here. He says that they are a royal one again? Again? Priesthood. Now, stop right there. That was not, that, that, that was radical. That was new. In the Old Testament, Peter here is going against something, radically going against something in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there was something very, very interesting about the Old Testament. The Old Testament, you know who, could, who are the ones who could be priests? They're, Israel had, had 12 tribes. You follow what I'm saying? Israel had how many tribes? 12. Out of the 12 tribes of Israel, how many of them were able, eligible to be priests? One. Who are they? The Levites. You guys, again, you guys are following, right? So you know, you know, the Levites. They were the only tribe that were supposed to be like Brother Levi, right? Yeah. He's a Levi by default, right? There we go. The name Levi. It was them. They, they were the only priests. But here's what I want to know. This is like this pastor teaching you a symbol of theology here. Every priest who had was a was a Levi, but not every Levite was a priest. <coughs> the Levites had many roles. Many roles. They sang, they played in the sanctuary, they were the guards of the sanctuary of the temple, they protected it, they cleansed it, they cleaned it. I mean, they did a lot of things in the temple, the sanctuary. But if you wanted to be a priest, you had to be a Levite. There was no way around it. And in the sanctuary, there were two classes of priests. There were regular priests and the, the high priests. The high priests entered the most holy place in the city. They were the only ones allowed. This thing was serious. The only ones allowed, and they entered the most holy place only once a year in the Yom Kippur day. We call it as the day of atonement, the day of judgment. And they entered there and they were they were they were doing atonement for sin. So 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 the, the, the one of the roles of a priest and a high priest was the role of intercession for the people. And they did it for a good amount of years. But the question that I have for you is this was this part of God's plan? No. I'm not going to surprise you today. Contrary to the Christian thought, 
the Levites was never part of God's plan in the first place. You heard me right. The Levites, in charge of the temple, they were never part of God's plan in the first place. Now I just dropped a bomb here. Now let me show you the Bible. Exodus 19, 5, this is now the story. The people of Israel were set free from, from Egypt. Now they're going to the promised land. What happens in Exodus 20? 20, 20, they receive the Ten Commandments. So this is right before they receive the Ten Commandments. And I want, I want to read this to you here. This is God is speaking. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasure possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me, a everybody, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Where did we hear this before? Peter. Peter is quoting from the Old Testament. So God's plan in the first place was for the whole nation to be a kingdom of priests. Everybody was supposed to represent God. The priest represented God. The priest interceded for the people. The Levites were the one upholding the truth and protecting the truth. They were supposed to teach the 12 tribes. But God's plan is for the whole nation to be doing that. Yes, they will do it through Aaron's lineage part, but not only the lineage, but Aaron's son. It will start with Aaron and his sons, you can read that. But God's plan was for the whole kingdom to be a kingdom of, of priests. So you guys got it. But that's not what happened, right? We know that's not what happened. Because we just said in the Old Testament, you had to be a Levite to be a priest. So what happened? I guess some water here is something that let you guys be curious a little bit. You guys want to know what it is? All right, Sydney wants to know. Anybody else wants to know it? All right, if you want to know, I just tell Sydney. Exodus 32 tells a story. You don't need to go there right now. But what happened is this. In Exodus 20, I mean, in Exodus 19, God is already speaking to Abraham, uh, to, to Moses, I'm sorry. And Moses there is the Mount Sinai, and he spends 40 days in there in that mountain. He loses, of course, track of time. And the people who are down tired of waiting, they go to Aaron and say, Aaron, come on. You know, this, we don't even know if he's alive. Maybe Moses died and he's snake bit him. We don't know. So you know what? Let's just, why don't you just make us a God out of gold so we can do what? Worship it. And what does Aaron do? He succumbs to the pressure and they, now he builds the golden calf. Famously known, right? And now what happens? Everybody singing, not everybody, but a big part of the, uh, of the, of the camp bows down before the image. <clears throat> Moses knows what is happening. He hears what is happening. He goes down and Moses is mad. He's furious like a dog. And then verse 25, you don't need to go there, but I'm going to read it to you. It says, and when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, I mean, they broke into, I love the expression, they just broke loose. It was total chaos. And then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is in the Lord's side? Come to me. And then the Bible says in verse 20, 20, 27, and he said this, and the sons of Levi gathered around him. The sons of whom? Levi. Levi. And then Moses commands them to go, to go and kill a lot of the people that bow down before the image. But now the whole tribe of the Levites, they went on his side. And then verse 29, are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? 29 he says, and Moses said, today you have been ordained for service of the Lord. Each one at the cost of his son, his brother, so they might be still a blessing upon you today. It was on that day that the Levites were ordained to be doing the work of God in the sanctuary, in the temple. Now, we cannot blame Moses for this. I mean, everybody else bowed down before that, that, that stupid golden calf. Where would he go? He had no, no chance. So what does it do? 
from that point forward, the work in the temple, the work in the sanctuary, the work of God on earth is only to the Levites. And God took that very seriously. You have several examples. But one of the examples, you know, this is just for your reference, King Uzziah, the king, one of the kings of Judah, prideful and arrogant. I'm the king. I've been anointed as king. So he goes into the temple and he wants to burn incense. Now, who was supposed to burn incense? The priest, the Levites. He burns and what happens? Anybody know the story? He becomes lepers as his punishment. God took this very, very seriously in the Old Testament. But was this part of God's plan? Was it part of God's initial plan? No. I want you to understand this. But did it last forever? Did it last forever? No. When Jesus died on the cross, something very interesting happened to the temple, Dr. Right? I want you guys to read this with me. Matthew 27 says this. And Jesus cried out again with, with what? Loud voice and yielded up his ear. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn into two from top to bottom. <coughs> this here marks the end of all the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. This, everything in the Old Testament that pointed to Jesus, everything that was linked to everything here at this moment ended because Jesus died on the cross. He was the Lamb of God. He ended all the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. From that point forward, being a Levite, be, I'm a priest, you know, I'm a son of Aaron. It was worthless. From that point forward, God was going to bless all flesh. His Spirit was not only on the Levites, was not only on the Jews. From that point forward, the Spirit will be poured out upon all flesh. You following me? So what does it mean to us that Jesus ended the sacrificial system? The first thing, my friends, that, that, that means to us, can you pass the next slide, please, uh, Jerson, for whatever reason got stuck here. First Timothy 2, Father, by the way, he says this, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ, Jesus, Jesus Christ. So, you know what that means? Man, you don't need to go through a priest to intercede for you. Nobody here needs to go to a man to intercede. You don't need to go and confess your sins to a man or to a woman for that fact, so you can be forgiven. We've got Jesus, amen? amen. Jesus is our high priest. You don't need to pay for forgiveness. If you made a mistake, you sin, go to Jesus directly. And then <coughs> Hebrews, go to Hebrews right now. I want you to read this passage in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 4. I love this text. Hebrews chapter 4. It puts it in a very beautiful way. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through verse 16. <coughs> Hebrews 4, verse 14 through verse 16. Look what he's saying. He's talking about Jesus. 4, 14 through 16. Look what he says. Since we have a what? A, a what? High priest. Who is this high priest? Let's read it. Who had passed through the heavens. Who is it? Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession of our faith. We are witnesses. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to do what? Sympathize with our witnesses. But one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with, let us then with what? Confidence. Draw near the throne of grace that we may receive mercy in the, and find a grace in the help in time of need. You know how powerful this is? This means it doesn't matter how filthy you are, how bad your sins are, how much you have messed up. Benjamin, that says you can go to God in your early age, as young as you are, and you will approach His throne not with fear, but with what? Confidence that you'll find what? 
grace and mercy. This is powerful. <clears throat> There's anyone here? Maybe, maybe if maybe I'm talking to preach to the choir. Maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe everybody's holy. But if you if you have sinned so bad, you feel so filthy and so dirty. Maybe you feel that God cannot hear your prayers. Yeah, sure He can hear His and hers, but not mine. You're afraid of praying to God that God will smite you right there. That's not the God that I know. What does it say? We can approach His throne with confidence that we find grace. This is powerful. And then I'm going to go back to this to 1 Peter. But we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people for His own possession. God bought us with His, with his blood. They may proclaim the excellences of whom who did what? Called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Friends, the work of God today on earth of proclaiming his excellences is not limited to a religious leader, to a priest, to, to a doctor in theology, to your pastor. This work is for all of us. So my question who must do the work of God on earth today? We all must do the work, right? I'm going to ask you, who must do the work of God on earth? <laughs> and once again, who must do the work of God? Oh. Who must do the work? Oh. We all must do the work. Once again, I want to hear you because I want to hear you say everybody, we all must do the work. We all. And let me say this. We come here. We say we believe this. Yeah, we believe this, Pastor. But I'm going to tell you, with all of the respect that we practice, we don't. In practice, we don't. Let me give you just a few examples. This may hit home to some of you. Pastor, my neighbor does not know the love of God. Pastor, my neighbor does not understand the Sabbath. Pastor, you have to come and speak to my neighbor about the love of God. Are you listening? Pastor does not have to go to your name. If the God Almighty put you in that house, in that corner, on that street, who is supposed to witness to your neighbor? Who? You. Not the pastor. Not the elder. Not the Bible teacher. God called you to witness. Not a pastor. Not a religious leader. Pastor, I need you to pray for me, Pastor. Don't misunderstand me. I love praying with and for people. But there are people who sometimes think that the only prayer that God... Are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? There are people who think that the only prayer that God is going to hear is the prayer of a pastor. Oh no, if, my, if the members pray for me, if, they, if my brother prays, nah. But if the pastor prays for me, now God is going to listen. You don't even know if your pastor is an adulteress. You don't know if I have a sinful life behind the scenes. I can just come up here and pretend that you would not know. Who are you to say that my prayers are holier than yours? Are you listening? We've got to stop this. We've got to cut this out. You know, people come to the doors of the church and they're asking for prayers. And again, don't misunderstand me. I love the respect you have for the pastor. You guys love me and my family. I love, thank you so much. But you don't need to wait for the pastor to pray for somebody. You know what you do? If I, you know, for pastors, it's very easy to fall into the trap of thinking you are important. Pastor, we need you to pray. Pastor, great servant. Pastor. Yeah. I'm telling you, this can be good. But you know what the trap is? If I as a pastor is start, if, if I even glimpse, conceive the idea that I'm important, that is the pitfall of the ministry in this church. The pastor did not exist. To, oh, I gotta pray for them. No, if I don't pray, nobody else will know. But people come to the doors and give prayers. Let's just wait for the pastor. 
the tanks are coming to 500 people at the end. No, that's, the person sits for half an hour for a prayer. Pray. We have 10 elders in this church. How many? 10 elders. Godly men and one godly woman in this church. Elders. They can pray for you. The people, the person sitting right next to you right now, they love Jesus. They can pray for you. You've got pastors. They can be the greatest thieves of ministry. Stealing ministry from people. No, I gotta do this. I gotta pray. I gotta be there. But let me tell you another one. <laughs> you have your ministry. And then you throw the ministry you have an event in the church. If the pastor cannot make it, it is as if God was not there. Oh, we don't have support. Are you kidding me? You have 50 people there. You think you have no support? Because the pastor was not there? Are you listening? Next week. When? Next week. Next week. Are you do want to be here next week? Next week I'm going to tell you the this, this story. How this has cracked into the church. Next week. And I'm telling you, brother, so 52 years of Venice, maybe, you, maybe you've been at Venice for 60 years. I can guarantee you, if we could, if as Christians we could bet, I would bet a bit that many of you have never heard this before. Next week I'm going to tell you the whole background story of how this mentality of, the, of this, this religious figure, this pastor who gives you all, has crept into the Adventist church and how it could have crept into ours as well. As a pastor, I know my gifts. Um, I don't have many gifts. I don't. But the few ones that I have, I'm willing to grow and, and grow and grow and expand so the church can grow. Are you listening? This church, through the last few months, has gone through incredible things. Everything God does is amazing. And, every, and He's going to do something <laughs> Amazing today. Pastor, you're doing a fantastic job. Praise the Lord. But you know what? It is not only me. The moment I think that we're to know anybody has anybody counted how many baptisms we had this year yet? We lost count, right? You were the 17th person to be baptized this year. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. To God be the glory. 17 people this year, oh, and we're not even in July yet. God is doing amazing things. Pastor, you're doing a fantastic job. No. And it's not just the pastor. I'm proud to tell you that <coughs> practically I have not given one Bible study in this church. You know why? Because there are people, members, giving Bible studies. Doesn't mean the pastor is not busy doing other things, yes. But my goal is to empower you to do ministry. The little that I know, I'm here to empower you, coach you, teach you, so you can be the witness. You can do the ministry. I want you to bring the nature analogy here. Are you following? Can you follow, can you imagine like a beautiful grass a lawn? Can you imagine a meadow with me now? Right now, imagine like lambs and sheep all around running. And you see sheep running? Yeah. You see them running around and jumping, right? You see a shepherd. Can you see a shepherd right there? Can the shepherd make sheep? Can the shepherd make sheep? No. Can the shepherd make sheep? No. Who makes sheep? Jesus. Who makes sheep? Jesus. Sheep. Sheep make sheep. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? Sheep make sheep. It's as simple as that. So why do you think that the pastor is responsible for winning others? So I'm not. And every time we have a baptism, I, mean, I go way out of my way to try to show you that God has empowered you as well for the gospel ministry. The pastor has a role. But the same power, listen, I don't deserve it, but I know as my God lives that the Holy Spirit has used me. Because you pray for your pastor. Every time I meet you, pray for me, and I feel honored and humbled by your prayer. But God, can you, the same power that is upon me, can be upon, upon everybody else. The leaders of this church are being used by God. 
amazing things. You know the guys in the back who never see their faces? They're getting things ready. They're working things out, building things so things are not falling apart. They, God is with them. God is with Calvin. God is with Randy. God, God is with, with Jerson right in the back. God is with everyone. Have you seen what Faith is doing in the Sabbath school? She bought a little pocket so the kids now can hear Daniel. The kids are digging it. They're listening to the story. You know why? Somebody cares. The Holy Spirit is moving upon all of us. But you've got to cut this out that you think just the elder or the pastor. Oh, my mom is sick. If the pastor does not visit, it's like if God was not there. There were 40 people visiting there. We are the church. Who is the head of the church? Who is the head? Christ is the head of the church, not the pastor. If a member is there, the whole church is there. We have got to understand that when, when you are in ministry, you are a minister. Doesn't matter what you do. You're sitting in the spirits, you've given your life to Christ now. You know, Veronica, you were a minister. Rosemary, where is Rosemary? Where is Rosemary? Rosemary, you are a minister. You're a minister. People sitting right next to you, you're a minister. Also, you're a minister. Esther, you're a minister. You've got to understand that. It is so easy for us to go back to the, just the Levite, just the priest. No, my friends, the moment we do this, we are killing ourselves. And the growth of this church so far this year is not because of the pastor. First of all, it's because of God Almighty, amen? amen. God Almighty. But with the pastor, we have many leaders. Dell working her head off in the kitchen with the team there. Right there. It is hard. Don't you think this spirit is not working through her right there in that kitchen? Putting up with a lot of stuff? Yes. The Holy Spirit is working with all of us. Gail, I told you before, and, and Sarah, this health ministry is God-given. The Spirit is upon. We have different gifts. Different ways is demonstrated, but the Spirit is with all of us. So again, who must do the work of God on earth today? We are. Once again, who must do the work? We are. All, we all must do the work. So let's just summarize this. The first thing that this prophecy has to do with us today is what? We are His witnesses. Tell the story. No, no, to say, tell the story. Can't teach the Sabbath, tell your story. Can't teach the sin of the dead, tell the story. Can't sing, tell the story. And we are His priests. And but includes women. Women are not off this. God has called you as well. Truly, God called you to ministry as well. God called you, all of us. Bernice, God called you to ministry. You are deeply loved and anointed by God. God called you to ministry. All women sit in this church. God called you to ministry as well. In different capacities, in different roles. But God called you, all of us, for the work of God. Now the final one. Now love this. We are His kings and queens. I'm adding queens there because the language is... It, it's, it's, it embraces it all. Look what Revelation says this. <coughs> I want to read the part in orange. To him who loved us and watched, and what? Watched us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests. Kings and priests. To his God and the Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. God, let us sink in. God made us kings. We are reigning with God in the presence of Jesus. That does not make you better than other people. That gives you responsibility. But that gives you a huge sense of worth. It doesn't matter what others told you. Maybe you were raised in this home that told you you are, you are worthless. Maybe you were told many times that you're never going to amount to anything. Maybe you had an abusive husband, an abusive partner, Maybe, maybe, maybe you just, people all your life told you were dumb, you're stupid. <laughs> but what does the Word of God say? You are, you are a king. You are a queen. We are priests in the kingdom of God. This gives us a tremendous sense of worth. Now that's going to be interesting. <clears throat> you guys ready for this? Let me see this. Can you... 
Veronica, can you see this? What is this? Anybody can see what is this? It's what? A hundred dollar bill. Wow! Fresh. I need a volunteer. Can you volunteer? Oh, there you go. Come on, come on. Huh? Come on, come on. Let's put, let's put our hands together for a volunteer, please. Let's put our hands together. That was the quickest time we got a volunteer this year. Right? That was the good Come on, then. Now, I'm not seeing that I get this, by the way, okay? <laughs> Come on, I'm a pastor, man, you know? I'm broke, but, I, but I'm going to show you something. On my right hand, I have what? You think it's real? Hold it. You think it's real? It, it, it is real. And I, right now, I have what? A penny. Right? Okay, so I'm gonna ask, tell me about your name again. Yeah, Carrie. Carrie. All right, Carrie. <laughs> I want you to imagine this with me. You're down in a, in a gas station, like roadside gas station. How the bathrooms in a gas station usually? Horrible, right? Dirty. If you find a penny in a gas station, would you pick it up? <laughs> you, don't, you don't pick it up a penny in a gas station? But people stamped on it, they did other things to it, right there in the corner, dirty, dusty, you know, all dirty. Would you pick it up? No? Are you sure? <laughs> but if you found here in, in a church here, would you pick it up like this, just like nice and clean and shiny? Would you pick it up? Maybe. So would you give me a Can you pick it up? Give me a favor. Thank you. My back hurts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, right? That, that's the thing, right? Now, if you found a hundred dollar bill, now you're walking down the street, not the church, but if you found just like just right there in the corner. Just right there in the street, just like this, would you pick it up? <laughs> Smart, right? That's not wrong. So pick it up. <laughs> now, okay, okay. Are you, are, are you listening? I want you guys to pay close attention to this. What if I crush this now, right now? Still from the side of the street. You find it just like this. Would you pick it up? <laughs> what? Huh? Is it what? It's a hundred dollars. But I crushed it. It's still money. Oh. So money. Now, what, what if you find this brushed, stuck upon in the bathroom of, of a roadside uh, gas station, all dirty, in the back, right there in the little corner, right there, and you see the hundred dollar bill all crushed like this, and it's like it's filthy, and it is dirty. Would you pick it up? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can go back to your seat. I'm gonna give this. Thank you very much. I'm giving, I can give you the pen if you want, but I'm giving it. Right? Got, got, got to pay the bills. <laughs> got to pay the bills. No, but, but. Now, you know jokes aside. This is crushed, dirty, thrown out of the garbage. Why would you still pick this up? Because of what? Is that better, but you're missing one point. Is there any difference between a dirty $100 bill or, or a fresh crispy one? Is there any difference in the, in the work, in the value? Or oh, are you listening to me right now? I want you now to just, just let it sink in. Sometimes you may feel like a penny. Sometimes people told you for, the, for all your life you're worthless, that you're never going to amount to anything. Maybe life comes and crushes you at times. And people come and stump upon you and trample upon you and they toss you to the side and your sins are so dirty and filthy and you think you are worthless. But has it changed your value? Has it changed your value? No, he has not. I want to invite a praise team to start coming up right now. I want to understand no matter how life has crushed you, how bad things have happened to you, if people have Stand on you, stamp on you, trample upon you, whatever they have has happened to you. Nothing that has happened to you has changed your, your value. You know why? We are kings and kings. We are his witnesses. We are his priests until Jesus comes. So if there's anyone here today who's sitting here wondering, maybe I'm worthless. Maybe I slept with too many women. I slept with too many men. I drank too much liquor. Whatever I, I smoked too much. 
memory won't, I, I snort too much cocaine. Whatever it is you've been through in your life, this has not changed what? Your value. Your value is not because of you. Your value is because of the God who died on the cross, bled and died for you. That is His value. So you are as worth as the price of the living God who died on the cross for us. We're going to sing now, shine Jesus, shine. Fill our hearts, we've set our hearts on fire. And I want as we sing, there's anyone here today that maybe you think that you were worthless. Maybe you, you, you've gone through tough times and you feel like a penny. I, and, and the hundred dollar bills here, it's just an illustration. You're not, you're not worth a hundred dollars. You are priceless. Priceless. So don't ever let anyone ever better tell you that you are dumb, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're short, you're fat, you're too skinny, you ugly, whatever it is. How much life will crush you? You're still priceless. Because Jesus for the price. I'm going to see by the raising of hands. Do you understand today that God called you to minister as well? Let me see your hands to God. You understand that God called you to minister as well. Are you a minister? Say yes. Yes. You're a minister. But I have another question as well. Maybe you think you were worthless. Maybe you think you're not good enough. Pastor, what do I have? I'm not good with anything. Maybe you think that, that you just, you're being told you're worthless. You're never going to amount to anything. Do you understand today your value? If there's anyone here today, if you have not given your life to Christ yet, and today you understand His value, just raise your hand where you are right now. If you'd like to commit your life to Christ. If you have never committed your life to Christ today, just raise your hand where you are. Is there anyone here today who would like to recommit your life to Christ? And now you know your value. Maybe you thought you, you for a time you were depressed, you thought you were not good, but today you want to recommit your life to Christ. Just raise your hand where you are. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You are priceless. Doesn't matter how dirty you think you are, how much life has crushed you and it's stumbled upon you. You are priceless. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for your people, for your church. We are all doing God's work on earth. It's not about the pastor. It's not about just the leaders. We are all called to do the work. So I pray this church that the people here will understand and be empowered by your spirit because you, the power is available. I also want to pray for people that want to recommit their lives to Christ. Maybe there are people that came here today that felt worthless. They felt they were, they were just judged, thrown upon and, and trampled upon and, and they felt like trash and garbage. I pray they will never forget the value that they have in Jesus Christ. So I pray, the Lord, they will bless everyone here today. The blessing according to our needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.